Psalm 23 is a psalm of David, as I, as I said last week in kind of introducing this series. When we take, when we take the psalm at this pace, we will, be, we will be kind of highlighting, focusing pretty tight on some things. One very good author breaks the, breaks the psalm, and he's right if you look at it, in, into um, three kind of points of, not points of view, word pictures. Uh, though, though it is often seen as a shepherd psalm, and it is, King David, who wrote this psalm, had spent his childhood and, and youth doing the work of a literal shepherd. So shepherding was a metaphor with which he was very familiar. And the first couple of verses depict the life of a shepherd. We'll be in verse 2 tonight. The third and fourth verses shift to be more of a picture of a companion and guide on a dangerous journey. Now, the allusion to rod and staff there, those are still the tools of shepherding. But it is not often that a, that a shepherd would lead his flock through a dangerous valley. So there's a little bit of a shift. And then by verses 5 and 6, well, sheep don't eat at a table. So you prepare a table for me. The, 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 the metaphor has shifted now to a host uh, receiving and caring greatly for a guest. But we're still very much in the shepherding part. Last week we dealt with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if I could recap this, what I would hope to be the, the maybe central takeaway from last week. Is that we understand I shall not want as both, as both a promise that he will always provide for our needs, a promise that is other places in scripture as well, but a reiteration of the promised care of the shepherd for the sheep, because it is that, I shall not want, is a statement of fact. It also is direction for us. It is, it is, not, only, it is not only to be remembered as a promise that we shall not live in want, it is also to be accepted as a directive that we will not be an envious, covetous, um, needy people. Uh, it's funny. It came up last Wednesday night. I, I addressed it again in the message Sunday. Um, godly people. If you put the question to them, would you, would you live your life willfully bouncing around outside the Ten Commandments and in disobedience. <clears throat> of course not. No. You know? And yet covetousness is almost a national pastime in our culture. And again, there is nothing, there is nothing wrong with saying, I have a wish list. And I am developing the necessary personal industry. <laughs> found out from my <sighs> found out from my younger son. There's some kids in his neighborhood up in Orlando. The kids are about fourth grade. Kyle guesses third or fourth grade, and they 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 came around with flyers in their neighborhood. I think this is genius. They came around with flyers in the neighborhood. They're, again, they're about fourth graders, so they got mom and dad supervision. And they, they have a business. And for, I think it's $2 a month, or maybe it's $2 a week. I think it was $2 a week, so maybe eight, eight bucks a month, give or take. All in the world they do is they come to your house and they take your garbage cans and they put them on the street the night before garbage day. And they come back the next day and they put them back away. Now, I'd pay two bucks a week for somebody to do that. If I, had, if I had some enterprising upper elementary age kid in my neighborhood that was kind of willing to hustle, and you think about it, if he, can get, if he can get an eight or 10 buck subscription from everybody down one side of the street and up the other and come on garbage on, on the night before garbage and, and, and run his client's garbage cans at 20 steps to the street, I'm not terribly lazy. But, 
you know, tonight when I get home at 8, 15, 8, 30, it's garbage eve at my house. The garbage pickup is on Thursday in my neighborhood. I'd pay two bucks to just go on in the house and <laughs> put on my shorts and t-shirt and pop rather than having to take a few minutes between that and roll the garbage can to the street. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with seeking legitimate opportunities and ambitiously pursuing those legitimate opportunities. That's not wanting as this forbids or as the 10th commandment forbids. Wanting is happening when either you are, you are living in the pocket of God's provision and in your heart of hearts you are convinced it's not enough. That somehow God has mistreated you. I was sitting in a traffic light on Daniels. I had never seen a Rolls Royce SUV before. I didn't know they existed. Oh, they do. There's not really trim levels. You know, you don't get the Rolls Royce this, this, and this, apparently, in that SUV. I, I asked Gail, I said, okay, I, more power to the, I'm, I'm just curious, where do you park that thing? I mean, are you going to Publix where some, you know, some, some joker in a, you know, 10-year-old clunker? Some of you are driving, 20-year-old clunker? <laughs> Is going to give you a door ding because he just doesn't care anymore. How can you, how can you, it, it, it was a $600,000 vehicle. How are you going to put that on the streets in Fort Myers? I would have to build a huge glass case for it and never, ever, ever drive it anywhere. I, 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 I wouldn't want one if they were free. I don't want the responsibility for it. I drive a Hyundai Santa Fe from 22. The new one looks pretty good. I like the electronics in the, in the redesigned Santa Fe. Hmm. But what I cannot do is say that God has been unkind to me because I drive a Hyundai, you know? I like my Hyundai. God has not been unkind to me because I know people whose house is way bigger than mine. I just can't. Um, I hope you can't either. I hope that you are able to live in the pocket of what God has provided materially and even situationally and say, it's a fallen world, so nothing is perfect. But God has graciously provided for me as I am, where I am. And by the way, even your trials, even your trials, and in a room with more than two of us, there are trials in the room. Don't want. When you want, it's when you, you, are, you are lustfully, and I don't just mean that sexually, but when you are, when you are de infected desire for that beyond which God has made legitimately available to you. So the takeaway from verse one, and I know I've been a long recap, the takeaway from verse one is don't want. He has made sufficient available for you that your needs are provided for because he promised that he would. Your wish list, a different matter. Not necessarily sinful to have a wish list as long as you are honoring Christ in how you scratch items off that wish list. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. A resource that I have found very, very valuable for sort of guiding my meditation through the 23rd Psalm. It's another classic work. It's William Keller is the author, K-E-L-L-E-R. Many of you probably have this book on, on your shelf or on your device. <laughs> the book is called The Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Uh, Keller is a Bible teacher, but he's actually got a literal shepherding background. And so uh, a, a, it's, it's William Keller, a shepherd looks at Psalm 23. So what do I know from shepherding? Um, David knew quite a lot, which is why he's able to evoke these images. Keller seems to be very good at 
This is why the Lord led David to say that this way. So my outline is mine, but much of my understanding is from Keller. And here's my outline. Five things that I see in, in this verse that the Lord gives us. Roman numeral one. A posture. A posture. He makes me lie down. He makes me lie down. Here's what I know. And I'm not a prophet. I'm not a seer. I have no particular intel on you. But here's where I, what I know. You, right now, have plenty to be distressed about. If you don't think you do, you're not paying attention. There's a lot. Should you choose to dwell upon that which distresses you, you will have justification to be distressed. Our our brother Alan, and I, 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 will, I will use, because you have shared with the room, you have a medical test coming up on Monday. You have no idea what undiagnosed thing you've got going on that could be, you know, every single one of you in a fallen world, you're walking around inside a ticking time bomb. You know that, right? And, and one day you'll wake up and you won't. Uh, and I'm not making fun of chronic medical conditions. I'm not making fun of diseases. I'm certainly in no position to make fun of death. But you are a day closer to your own funeral than you were yesterday. Amen. And if you want to, <laughs> praise the Lord is right. But whoa, right? And who knows what else? You know, I've joked about $8 mayonnaise. We may get $12 mayonnaise before we're over. Who knows, economically. Um, you watch the political landscape, and it's, it's like, I, you know, how many sequels is Dumb and Dumber going to have? And <laughs> in a country of... Millions and millions and millions of people. This is what we get. Yeah. But I digress. <laughs> he makes me lie down. <laughs> How's your sleep lately? How's your sleep? You say, well, I've got a lot going on. Oh, if, if having a lot going on is going to eviscerate your sleep, you'll never sleep again. Are you, are you waiting to have a time when you don't have a lot going on? Well, Brother Russell, I won't have this same stuff going on. Okay, I, I agree. It'll be different stuff. He makes me lie down. Keller, Keller says there are at least four things that will make a sheep not lie down. I didn't know any of this. Keller provided, this list is, this list is from Keller. First thing, in order to lie down, in order to, to repose, to rest, a sheep has to be free of fear. Um, there can be no perceived physical threats around the sheep. Um, he tells stories of like people who came to visit him when uh, he, he, I think he said a flock of 300 sheep. He had a, he had a guest come visit him on his farm and a, a small yippy dog, and I love dogs, but a small yippy dog hopped out of the car as his guest arrived, and his entire flock of 300 sheep bolted in every direction in response to that one little comparatively harmless yippy dog. Um, any sort of startling disturbance apparently can just absolutely shatter the rest of a flock of sheep. The resting of a flock of sheep. So the shepherd has to stay awake. The shepherd has to keep his eye on the perimeter. The Lord is our shepherd. I love Psalm 
121, verse 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. I think it was my grandfather who first pointed that verse out to me years and years ago, like when I was in high school or college. And he said, Psalm 121.4 is what he thinks about when he gets ready to go to bed at night and there are things that want to rattle around in his head and keep him awake. And my grandfather, my grandfather Stedman, said, you know what, Russell? It just helped, that verse helps me remember that God's going to be up all night anyway. May as well let him work on it overnight. I'll go on to sleep and pick it up with him in the morning. Now that's a plain understanding of what I'm certain has a great deal more theological complexity. But he's on watch all night anyway. I take great comfort in that because I don't want to be on watch all night. Sheep need to be free of fear. Second, they have to be free of conflict. Apparently within the flock, and I never knew this, apparently within flocks of sheep there's a great deal of social hierarchy. Um, in the flock, as Heller describes it, it's usually the older ewes, the older females, that kind of want to make certain things are to their liking. And they will, they will butt smaller sheep. They will kick. But when the shepherd steps into the situation, they back up. Because they recognize that the shepherd is, 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 the, is the, the real alpha. Right? Our shepherd reminds us, even, even in conflict, he's there. He is our shepherd. He's present. And his presence should keep us from headbutting each other. And should remind us that any silly power or dominance games we want to play, well, we are, we are accountable to his authority above all else. To lie down, sheep have to be free of fear and free of conflict. They have to be free of pests. Um, a modern shepherd apparently spends quite a lot of time and attention on like dipping the sheep in, in chemicals to keep them free of parasites and whatever ticks or whatever it is that, that wants to live on them. And it is, a, it is a matter of constant vigilance. And one of the ways you can tell a sheep is having a problem with, with pests and bugs is that they get real, real restless. Um, and that affects the quality of the wool. It affects the quality, if you're raising them as a meat crop, it affects the quality of the, their weight and the quality, it, it's bad. So you have to be very, very diligent to care about the small pesky things your sheep are dealing with. Let me say that again. A good shepherd is diligent to care about the small pesky things his sheep is dealing with. You ever catch yourself wondering if, if an issue in your life that's bothering you is a big enough deal for you to pray about? <laughs> What have you ever had in your life that is a truly big enough deal for you to bother God with? Who do you think you are? If you're going to use your perceived scale, yeah, but this is, this is not a big deal. Again, I ask you, if that's your, if that's your rule of thumb, what, what about you should the omnipotent, omniscient, omnitemporal, eternally existing King of Kings and Lord of Lords care about? If you're going to sort your stuff into big stuff and small stuff, all your stuff would live very comfortably in the realm of small stuff to the great I am. So if he cares about anything, he cares about your small stuff. So never, ever, ever think anything that would concern you at all is below the threshold of his concern. Pray about your small stuff. 
the shepherd in order for his sheep to rest. Yeah, he's got to deal with, with, with rat, rat, uh, ravening carnivores, but he's also got to deal with fleas or his sheep can't rest. The fourth thing that will keep a sheep from resting is hunger, which leads us to the remainder of this first line of verse 2. He makes me lie down. That is posture. Roman numeral 2, places. He makes me lie down in green pastures. you kind of get an Ireland picture. You're just rolling, rolling hills of really beautiful grass just as far as the eye can see. Let me, let me yank us back into a little bit of reality for a moment for context. This is the Middle East. The barren, rocky, desert-like Middle East. If a shepherd in the Middle East is shepherding his flock in green pastures, plural, in addition to his animal husbandry, he's probably doing a great deal of, of land clearing, plowing, planting of the right and cultivating of the right sort of, you don't just go find a meadow. This is not Kentucky. This is not Ireland. This is the barren Middle East. And for the shepherd to have green pastures, plural, to which he could tell, oh, there are certain river valleys to be sure. But the climate is an arid desert. And green pastures don't happen accidentally or even incidentally in that climate. You go to that climate today. Uh, Bedouin shepherds in the Middle East work very, very hard. They're very migratory. And if they're going to have multiple shepherds, that uh, multiple pastures that they have access to, they're doing a great deal of work to have those pastures. Finish this statement for me. The grass is always greener. Ah, oh, we come back to coveting, don't we? I think it was, and, and this is, this, if, if I'm right, this is, book probably dates back to the 60s. There was a, 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 a female author, of, a writer of funny books that, that <laughs> my mom, because I just went through a lot of my mom's books, Irma, Irma Bombeck. Yeah. Okay, all right, good. I'm not making that up. Apparently, one of her books was called The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank. I like that better than The Grass is Always Greener Over on the Other Side. Do you know why the grass is greener over the septic tank, right? There's a whole lot of stuff you don't want to deal with. <laughs> have, you, have you thanked him for the green pastures in which he has given you a place to rest? <clears throat> It doesn't mean that everything in your life is perfect. You and I live in the same fallen world. But oh, the green pastures. Most of us are not living right now in a food crisis. Some in the world are, many in the world are, but I'm talking to a room full of of, of North Americans in a classroom at McGregor. And if you are in food crisis right now, you must let this body of Christ know we have ways of coming alongside that. But I think I'm safe to say most of us aren't. In fact, most of us, if, if, if the line of real need and real lacking is, is, is here. Most of us have lived so far above that line for so long, we have a hard time classifying what real need is versus just, because, because we, we routinely navigate such amazing abundance. Is that, is that a fair? 
And again, if you, if you are in some crisis, you would certainly be welcome in this room. Um, I'm not saying that you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not able to live in that abundance, you're not welcome here. What a horrible thing. I would never say that. Um, and God can put us through periods of, of real lack and real wanting and real in order to drive us more deeply into, into dependence upon him and to remind us that it, we are actively dependent upon him, though he may have taken such good care of us for so long, we've lost sort of the edge on what it is to remember that we are so dependent upon him. But we have these places, these abundant green pastures. In that same phrase, I would, Roman numeral three, provision in green pastures. According to Keller, in order to flourish, both in, in gaining and maintaining healthy weight and in having healthy pregnancies that produce your next generation of, of lambs, it is ideal that the, that the sheep, and again, I don't know, but apparently it is ideal that the sheep be able to, to eat well and then fairly quickly rest kind of where they are. You don't want to have the eating pasture in one place and the resting pasture in another. So not just that the place is a green pasture, but in that green, not, and not only is it green like spray painted green, it's green because the, the, the grass there or whatever other grazing plants are there are the right stuff. That there's an abundance, not just of a, of a, of a setting, but of specific provision in that setting. My God will supply all your needs is a promise with teeth. What do I mean it's a promise with teeth? It's a promise with teeth in that it is, it is simply a promise as it is stated. Paul shares that promise in context with the Philippian church and their expression of generous giving to him as he jailed in Rome has received a love offering gift from the church at Philippi. And he's reminding them that they should have no concern that their generosity toward him is going to put them in a place where their needs aren't met. In, in, in cliche terms, it's the it's it's a it's a it's a you can't outgive God passage. But in the in the, in the course of that, he promises on God's behalf. We have the same promise because it's in God's word that our God will supply all our needs. Why do I say that's a promise with teeth? If God has promised to provide all our needs, and in my life. He has not provided X. What must I conclude about X? I don't need it. Well, I don't like that at all. I want to reserve for myself, thank you very much, the right to define what is a need and what isn't. I want to get to, I, I, I want to own that determination. One of our sons, I don't remember which, so I'm not embarrassing anybody in particular, but when one of our sons was very, very small, one of his phases and phrases that he went through was, but I need it, with the need really drawn out. And usually, usually that sentence uttered somewhere in either a toy department or a candy aisle or some other place like that where a tiny little kid would, but I need it. And I wonder how often God's heard me use that same kind of silly language about something that he has determined is at least for now, not a need. I don't always like that. He makes me lie down in green pastures and all the grass that I need to munch is right there. And the great place to rest is right there. And again, don't walk out of here tonight saying that I am holding or seeking to export some Pollyanna view 
where all of Christianity is, is rest and abundance. Never, ever would I say or even imply such a thing. Trials, difficulties are part of what it is to follow Jesus. In this world, he said, you will have troubles. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, he went on to say. So you're going to have, of course you're going to have moments, even seasons of difficulty. Of course you are. But even in the midst of difficulty, he will provide for you a green pasture to rest in. Posture, places, provision. The second line of the verse. He leads me beside still waters. Roman numeral four. Progress. He leads me. He leads me. We'll get to still waters in a moment. He leads me. What a remarkable thing that is. The living God is not the God of the deist who might believe in the existence of God, but he's distant. Or even the theist who who might believe that God somehow gets involved sometimes in stuff, but not on a personal level, just big picture stuff. Now, the God of Christianity leads his people. He leads me. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. Notice it's not saying don't have your own understanding. It's saying don't put your weight on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart is the positive commandment. Don't lean on your own understanding is the negative. But they're saying the same thing. In all your ways acknowledge him. And then a consequence falls out. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him, the consequence that falls out is he will make your paths straight. He will direct your paths, as I originally memorized it in an older version of the Bible. To be a little bit fair to myself, there are many, there are many circumstances in which I am not a control freak. <laughs> to be fair to myself. In uh, one of the ones that affects my day to day life. Um, and this is, I, this is a grace gift of God. That the, that the Lord has designed, and, I'm, and, and this is not ecclesiology night, but it's an important illustration, and I'm the one teaching. And it's an important illustration in, in, in my own experience. Uh, the Lord has designed the New Testament church to be uh, led by a body of elders, multiple elders. Sharing the burden. The church has one great shepherd. The church has a head. His name is Jesus. And so the, the stuff of under-shepherding the church is supposed to fall to a group of godly men that God sends to the congregation, that the congregation affirms, who then serve as an elder body. And I think think part of the reason you have multiple elders is we can all we can all shine spotlights into each other's blind spots and that's a good thing but I, I hope and believe that my, my brothers who have served 
and are serving with me on the elder body would say that in terms of, of church governance, oversight, one of the words for elder is episcopos. Epi means above, scopos means sight, like, like a telescope or microscope. Episcopos, oversight, is a word that is sometimes translated uh, bishop, but it is literally overseer, and it's one of the synonyms for elder in the New Testament. So in the business of overseeing the body of Christ, I don't think I'm a control freak. Amen. Thank you for that, my, my brother who has served as an elder ably and well. Carrie's shaking his head a little bit, but he has to deal with me. <laughs> Omar, Omar is, can't decide whether he wants to nod or shake his head. I've got, I've got other pastors in the room, you know. But wow, left to my own devices. You know what a control freak is? A control freak is someone who not only wants to get their way, but is thoroughly convinced that it's bad for the universe if they don't get their way. In certain aspects of my life, you ought to, you ought to see my budgeting <laughs> set up at the house. The, the, the multiple spreadsheets, multiple tabs of spreadsheets, the accounting software. I can tell you within $10 what my checking account balance is going to be on December 15th of this year. <laughs> it's not healthy. <laughs> I've got contingencies built in to quantify that which is not predictable. In case an unpredictable thing happens, it triggers a contingency and it's all still in the plan. <laughs> Until something happens that just wrecks it. I want to see a long way ahead. That's my point. So I read, he leads me. And I think, what if he's not willing to lead me in this long-term way of looking at things that I'm most comfortable with? See, because here's the deal. Him leading me implies that I'm following, right? You've heard me say this before. Jesus' most frequently occurring single word gospel invitation. And he often wrapped it up with other words, but at the heart of many of Jesus' evangelistic appeals was the word follow. Take up your cross and follow me. Leave your nets and follow me. If, any, if anyone wishes to um, be mine, he must deny himself and follow me. Follow me. It's a recurring theme. If you and I were going somewhere tonight after, after we finish up, and maybe, there's a, maybe we're going to go somewhere and grab a bite to eat. And it's a place you know that I don't. I'm headed home, so the example breaks down. Uh, but, but if we were, and, 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 and set aside for a moment Google Maps and Waze or GPS or whatever you're using, and it's just going to be old school. You know where the place is, I don't, and I'm going to follow you. The moment I commit to follow you, a serious loss of control happens. <laughs> Not only am I not in charge of the destination, I'm not in charge of the speed, I'm not in charge of the route. All in the world I am to do is keep my eye on your bumper and follow you. So you can't follow and be in control. He leads me means he leads. And I am to trust in him with all my heart. What do you mean a right turn here? It doesn't make any sense to make a right turn here. Oh yeah, I'm following. It doesn't have to make sense to me to make the right turn here. Because I'm not leading, I'm following. He leads me. I've given up my mastery of the destinations of life. I've given up my mastery of the route. I've given up my mastery of the pace. Because he's leading. There are times when I chafe. When his unfolding leadership either doesn't match my preferences 
or puzzles me or just plainly frustrates me. Lord, I'm real clear this is what you want from me. Lord, may I be real clear it ain't what I want. Yeah, and by the way, he can handle that prayer. If he couldn't handle that prayer, I'd have been blasted out of my shoes by a lightning bolt multiple times over the year. Another thing I've learned about his leadership, and this is, a, this is another word picture that's very, very useful to me, especially for those of you who like to know well in advance how the details are supposed to play out. You would never plead guilty to being a control freak. You call yourself a long range planner. <laughs> Tonight when I do get in my car to drive home, I don't know how dark it'll be. It won't be quite dark yet, but let's, let's, let's assume for a moment that it's gotten to be dark by the time I get ready to go home. When I get in my car, I'm gonna turn on my headlights. You know what my headlights are not going to do? They are not going to light the road all the way home. They're going to give me, what, 40 feet, 50 feet? I don't know anything about headlights. Ambitiously, maybe 100 feet of illumination in front of my car. Is that enough light for me to get all the way home? No. But it is enough light for me to get to the edge of the headlights. I can drive 100 feet in the light provided by those headlights. And by the time I do that, they will have illuminated the next 100 feet. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very good thing for you to remember. If you, if you can't make a decision because your headlights aren't lighting the route all the way home, you need to learn to drive to the edge of the headlights. And then trust God for the next 100 feet. And then trust God for the next 100 feet. Your headlights will light the way home, but they will not light all the way home till you start moving. Because another thing about following is following does involve movement. Sometimes when I'm counseling folks, and this is broad enough that I'm not calling out anybody. <laughs> this is a lot of people down the years. And whether they use the words or not, part of what they're struggling with is a sense that they're feeling stuck spiritually. I have, a, I have a question and a suggestion. If you suspect you might be stuck spiritually. Is he leading me? Am I following him? Here's my question that I would ask, and here's my suggestion I would make. My question I would ask is, what is the last thing you saw in his word the last distinctive thing you saw in the Word of God that necessitated in your life a real change in attitude or action. Can you, does it pop right into your, oh yeah, I know that, I saw it my quiet time three days ago and it rattled me and I'm, I am right now working to change that. The last thing you saw in His Word, I'm not talking about one more cute truth that you put on your chain of beads of cute truths. I'm talking about the last time the Word of God demanded of you a change in your attitude or action. If you can't think of it, then my, 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 how grown up you must be. You have already arrived to the point that significant changes in attitude and action for you are no longer necessary? I, I, I think not. And the question, the suggestion I would, I would make, a prayer that I have prayed, but it's, it, this, this is a big red button prayer. This prayer has a locked cover, and you open the cover, and there sits the big red button. If you'll pardon my Cold War missile metaphors, I'm a child of the 60s, right? <laughs> Get along with God. If you're feeling stuck, if you feel like this experience of him leading me is not what I'm experiencing, get along with God. Brace yourself and pray. And I'm not one on canned prayers. I'm not one on liturgical prayer. But make this your prayer. Lord, I'm yours. I follow you. Right now I'm feeling kind of stuck. So, Lord, what is one thing, not ten, not five, 
what is one thing in my life right now that displeases you? What one thing in my life right now is just not the way it ought to be? Lord, give me the clarity to know it and the intent and the power of the Holy Spirit to change it. One thing. Boy, I don't, you know, the speed of thought outraces the speed of speaking. And typically when I have opened myself up in a quiet time to that sense of stuckness, I don't have to get that prayer out of my mouth and I'm going, oh, Lord, not that. I've been spiritually procrastinating progress in that area for a year. I don't want to deal with that, which just makes it clear that my stuckness is on me. You know, if I'm not if I'm not willing to deal with the areas where he's willing to convict and then I'm going to whine that he won't convict me in areas that are more to my liking. Who's leading and who's following? He leads me. And he does and he will. And if you're and if you're feeling as though you're stuck or stationary, it's not that he's failing to lead, right? And I don't mean that to be mean. I promise you, I have many, many. I'm a veteran of seasons of stuckness. I got no high horse about that. And there have been times when I've been stuck and I've been afraid to even be that raw in prayer. Because I might think, oh, I know what he's going to point out. And I don't want to look at that right now. Wow. But he leads me. So I have his progress. And finally, moment five. I have his peace. He leads me beside still waters. Now, everyone who's ever taught this psalm, and Keller makes this point, apparently, if the water is fast moving, sheep don't want any part of it. The noisy, noisy, rapidly flowing water, um, a sheep will ignore the noisy, rapidly flowing water and even go looking. And, and, and apparently, sheep will drink foul water before they will drink turbulent water. Turbulent water scares them. Sheep are very timid, I gather. Peace is available to you. Once you start looking for the Bible's prohibitions on the, the sort of the, the package of things that orbit around covetousness, worry, discontent. Once you go, all right, is that, is that stuff really there? Am I really not supposed to have this, this, this life marked by all this anxiety? Philippians, again. Chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Years ago, they handed me the most <coughs> presumptuous, presumptuously named degree that has ever existed. In December of 1986, they told me I was a master of divinity. I was not at that time, and I am not now. <laughs> There's plenty in the Bible that bugs me because I can't get a clear handle on, on what it's trying to say. I just want to get to the point that as a Bible student, I just understand everything in the Word of God. You won't. No one ever does. Dr. Rogers, Adrian Rogers, my mentor, called it, said that the Word of God is a pool so shallow that a child can wade safely in it and so deep that a diver can never find the bottom. I like that. I, I affirm that. But it's not the parts of the Bible 
that I don't understand that bug me most. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand. Do not be anxious about anything is not deeply mysterious. I don't have to dig into my graduate Greek notes to figure out what he's saying. What he's saying is, brace yourself, don't be anxious about anything. If, therefore, you are anxious about anything, you are out of bounds from the direction of his word, and that's not great. Yeah, but what's the alternative? Oh, keep reading. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. God, I'm anxious about this, and I'm thankful to you. I got some, I got some requests on the topic that's causing me some anxiety. I don't mind you knowing what I wish were true that isn't yet. Let your request be made known to God. Here it comes, an astonishing promise. Now this promise is in the shadow of that direction, right? So obey on the, on the handoff of your concerns to God and your anxieties with them. Hand those things off to God as directed in verse 6. And the consequence is verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Obey verse 6. The benefit is verse 7. The peace of God that passes understanding. I misunderstood that verse in a nuanced way. I misunderstood that verse for a lot of years. I used to think that verse was saying, the peace of God which is so good you can't even understand it. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart. And that's wonderful. But that's not exactly what's going on in that verse. If I may expand a little bit, the, the RSHV, <laughs> Those are my initials. Uh, the, the, the Russell S. Howard version. It is the peace of God which surpasses that peace which comes from understanding. There is a peace that comes from understanding. I made a, a dumb parenting mistake one night that taught me about this. <coughs> And again, I don't remember which of my... My boys are only two years apart, so a lot of the, the, the ages and phases of life tracked pretty close. I had, I had two preschoolers at the same time and pretty much two elementary kids at the same time. And the boys were in younger elementary age. We were living in Memphis, Tennessee, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it was in Memphis. Um, Memphis got really rock and roll thunderstorms. Not, maybe no worse than the worst of what's here, but... but Big thunderstorms. One night, there was a big thunderstorm, and it was in the middle of the night, and, and, and I heard one of my guys crying out in his room. It was, it was scary. It was one of these shake-the-house thunderstorms. So being, being dad, I got up and went down the hall to my little boy's room. Daddy, you know, I'm scared. It's a bad storm. God help me, I started to explain to him what lightning and thunder are. <laughs> So what happens is there's, there's a, there's a pent-up electric charge that happens between the clouds. There's a lot of energy in the clouds and the ground, and, and eventually the, the lightning closes that circuit, and there's a, it's, it's really it's just a great big spark, you know? And that great big spark makes the air really, really hot around where the spark is, so hot that the air molecules aren't very dense there anymore. And the dense air rushes into that vacuum created by that burst of heat, and it makes a loud boom. That was exactly zero help. <laughs> what I was attempting to impart to my son, now get this, I was attempting to impart the peace that comes from understanding. You get it? How often have we settled for the peace that comes from understanding? It's not awful. I'd rather understand than be ignorant. The peace that comes from understanding is okay as far as it goes, if you can understand. 
So my son is looking at me like, okay, are we doing science now? <laughs> so I said, all right, son, 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 forget all that. Who loves us more than anything? God, right? <clears throat> Who's in charge of that storm out there? God. So do you need to be scared? No. He turned over and he went to sleep. A meteorology lesson got him to the peace that comes from understanding. Remembering who the Lord of the storm is got him to a peace that surpassed the peace that came from understanding. That's what Philippians 4, 7 is talking about. You can settle for the peace that comes from understanding. You can, analyze the, you can analyze the fire out of your circumstances and get the peace that comes from understanding. If you're willing to settle there, more power to you. I'm not, and you shouldn't be either. If you will, if you will hand off your burdens to him, remembering the one to whom you are handing off your burdens... He has promised you a peace that surpasses that peace which is available from understanding. That is Philippians 4, 7. That is the shepherd leading you beside the still water, the peaceful water, the water from which you can peacefully drink. Okay. Starting next week, we go through a very dark valley with our shepherd. That was my teaser. Let's pray together and we'll be done. Lord, you make us lie down in green pastures and you lead us beside still water, waters. You are the great shepherd of your sheep. And we are timid, not terribly bright, We miss stuff. Worst of all, we convince ourselves that our need for you is less than it is. Forgive us our hubris. Forgive us our self-sufficiency. Forgive us our lack of, of, of staying mindful of our dependence upon you because we live in a culture that encourages us to say, I got it, I got it, and we don't. We really, really don't. But you do. And you have loved us. And Lord, thank you for that. Now, Lord, we've got, we've got driving to do and households to return to and stuff that needs doing. May we, may we serve and follow well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And good night. Amen.